One of the most feared and ruthless kings to rule over England was Edward I, who became known as the Hammer of the Scots for his ferocious command on the battlefield and for his raids against his enemies. He was a king who would also bring the Welsh to heel, and he was a warring monarch who would tower above his enemies, as he was a very tall king, an imposing man. He embodies the medieval ideals of a king as a soldier, a skilled administrator, and a man who was also devoted to his religion. He would restore the power of the monarchy also, and he was a man who would be criticised for his warring actions, as he would slaughter many innocent people when he raised settlements to the ground. However, in July 1307, at the age of 68, King Edward I died, and he was, by the standards of the medieval period, a very elderly man. However, he would then be buried inside of Westminster Abbey. But the coffin of King Edward I was opened a number of times, and what those who did this found was shocking and incredible. Join us today as we look at opening the coffin of King Edward I, and as always, to support our channel, please make sure to subscribe. Edward I, also known as Edward Longshanks, was the eldest son of King Henry III, and he would be married to Eleanor of Castile. He would even, as a prince, attack some of his subjects, and he would make a number of enemies. Edward was a skilled commander, and he would, as a prince, take control of the government, as his father allowed him to do so, but following his father's death, he became the king. He was crowned on the 19th of August, 1274, inside of Westminster Abbey. He had been an arrogant, lawless and violent prince, but he had a lot to prove to his subjects. But he was a man who was incredibly loyal to his family and friends, and he was a courageous and brilliant military leader. Edward was also described as handsome, powerful and tough, and if you would have imagined an ideal medieval king, then you'd probably be thinking of Edward I. He channelled his anger and became a more patient ruler, and he valued his parliament and used these to consolidate his power. But Edward would be best known for his conquests, and he destroyed the autonomous principality of Wales, and Edward would invade Wales and blockade the leaders and force them into submission. He used sieges and starvation to do this, and English rule would be established, but when the Welsh rebelled, the uprisings would be ruthlessly crushed by Edward's army. For over 100 years, relations between the Scots and the English were okay, and the border region was rather peaceful. However, Edward stirred up hatred and launched a number of savage campaigns against the Scots, and he wanted to seize power in the country, and wanted to establish the land as a vassal state, answerable to the English crown. He even placed a puppet king in charge of Scotland, but Edward would invade and conquer, and he removed the coronation stone of Schoon from the land, and this went to Westminster Abbey. He would face defeat against the Scots and against William Wallace, but he would smash through Wallace eventually, and would sentence him to be hanged, drawn and quartered. But around 1306, Edward I was clearly ill, and his royal court spent a lot of money on medicines from all around Europe, and they even imported leather leggings to keep off issues with his legs. Edward's legs were treated, and the king was also placed in a neck brace at times, and he suffered from pain in his joints. Edward took herbal baths and drank other medicines, and his health fluctuated and went up and down in his final years. But when he was travelling to Scotland for yet another campaign, he was taken very ill. He was determined to finish the job against the Scots. On the 6th of July 1307, Edward and his army were resting at Burg by Sands, on the English side of the northern border, and the king was resting in his tent. But the following day in the morning, his servants entered the tent, and they saw the king, and they could not get him from his bed, and when they lifted Edward's body, he was limp and lifeless, and it was clear he was dead. He had died in the night, and there were many stories which emerged about his remains. One said that his heart was told to be carried to the Holy Land, along with crusaders to fight there, and another said he wanted his bones to be taken as relics on future expeditions against the Scots. Edward I's body was sent south, and it arrived at Waltham Abbey in Essex, and he was laid in state. Vigils and prayers were held for Edward I's soul, and by September 1307, Edward I's funeral was being prepared, and around mid-October, the king's body was moved from Waltham Abbey to the Monastery of the Holy Trinity, and to other places, before it eventually got to St Paul's Cathedral. On the 26th of October, the king's body arrived at Westminster Abbey. The ceremony was rather solemn, and the king was buried inside of his coffin, which was lead-lined, wearing his coronation robes, 
and this included a red silk tunic and a cloth of gold lower garments. The king in his coffin was buried with a crown on his head, and in his hands were scepters of royal office. Edward I was then buried inside of a plain black Purbeck marble tomb. There wasn't an ornate effigy on top of it, and his tomb is rather interesting, as it is not the most lavish compared to others inside of Westminster Abbey, despite the importance of this specific king. There were many rumours about the king's coffin, and also his tomb, and this included that he may have intended to have had this as a temporary burial site, as the king wanted his body to be boiled down and then the bones being taken on crusade, as mentioned earlier. But the tomb encapsulated Edward's personality. His coffin and tomb would be opened a number of times though throughout the century, and what those people who opened the remains of Edward Longshanks up found was remarkable. The first recorded time in which the king's coffin was broken into relates to the 14th century, and around 70 years following Edward I's death. In the close roll or the scrolls regarding the accounts of King Richard II's kingship, there was an entry recorded that said, To the treasurer and chamberlains, order of the king's money to renew the wax about the body of King Edward I, buried in the church of St Peter Westminster, as used here too to be done. With this it's clear that the body of Edward I was being rewrapped in cerecloth, the heavy wax cloth that was wrapped around a body to preserve it. This means that for this to happen, either the king's coffin was opened, and then his body was removed, and then the wax was placed all over the remains and the seer cloth that existed, making the cloth even heavier. Or another possibility is that the king's remains were unwrapped from the seer cloth, and then the new wax was placed upon the body, and then rewrapped, meaning Edward I's corpse may have been exposed to the elements. However, yet again, Edward I's corpse would be disturbed and his coffin was opened in 1774, over four centuries since he had died. What those who opened the body, the Society of Antiquaries in London discovered, was incredible. They found that the body had been well preserved, despite being interred 467 years ago. This meant that the seercloth and wax had done a remarkable job. It was said when Edward I's coffin was opened that... The chin and lips were entire, but without any beard, and the sinking or dip between the chin and the under lip was very conspicuous. Both the lips were prominent, the nose short as if shrunk, but the apertures of the nostrils were visible. There was an unusual fall or cavity on that part of the bridge of the nose, which separates the orbits of the eyes, and some globular substance, possibly fleshy part of the eyeballs, was movable in their sockets under the envelope. It was said, on lifting up the lid of the tomb, the royal body was found wrapped in a strong and thick linen cloth, waxed on the inside. The head and face were covered with a sudarium, or a face cloth of crimson, sarsenet wrapped to three folds, conformable to a napkin used by our saviour in his way to crucifixion. On flinging open the external mantle, the corpse was discovered in all the ensigns of majesty richly habited. The body was wrapped in a fine linen cerecloth, close-fitted to every part of the body, even to the very fingers and face, the writs ordering the renewal of the waxen covering of the body of King Edward I, being extant, gave rise to this search. Over the cerecloth was a tunic of red silk damask, above that a stole of thick white tissue crossed the breast, and on this at six inches distant from each other, quatrefoils of filigree, work of gilt metal set, with stones imitating rubies, sapphires, amethysts, and the intervals between quatrefoils on the stole powdered with minute white beads, tacked down in the most elegant embroidery, in form not unlike what is called the true lover's knot. It was also said of the king's gown that, above these habits were the royal mantle of crimson, rich crimson satin, fastened on the left shoulder with a magnificent fibula of gilt metal richly chased, and ornamented with four pieces of red and four pieces of blue transparent paste, and twenty-four more pearls. The corpse from the waist downwards was covered in a rich cloth of figured gold, which fell down to the feet and was tucked beneath them. On the back of each hand was a quatrefoil, like those on the stole. In the king's right hand was a scepter with a cross of copper gilt, and of elegant workmanship, reaching to the right shoulder. In the left hand was a rod and dove, which passed over the shoulder and reached to the ear. The dove stood on a ball placed on three ranges of oak leaves of enamelled green. The dove was of white enamel, 
On the head was a crown, chased with trefoils made of gilt metal. The head itself was lodged in the cavity of the stone coffin, always observable in those receptacles of the dead. The corpse was dressed in conformity with ancient usage, even as early as the time of the Saxon Sabert. They also remarked that the tomb was very plain and had been well preserved in the northwestern corner of the chapel. However, King Edward's coffin contained the remains of the king in a very good state, and those who broke into the tomb and coffin were amazed by the king's clothes and also the grave goods and regalia he was buried with. They also measured the king's height and determined he was six foot two, which was very large for a medieval man. But the discovery and opening of the coffin of Edward I over four centuries after his death was incredible and also shocking, and to disturb his remains 400 years later just to measure his height is rather strange. Thanks for watching. To support our channel, please make sure to subscribe, and once again, thank you so much for watching.